All right, last week we started looking at, uh, at 2 Thessalonians, and in verses 3 and 4 of chapter 1, Paul explains their obligation to give thanks for the Thessalonians, and their, their faith is flourishing, and their love for one another is increasing, which is God's work among them. That's his granting of the prayer that Paul reported in 1 Thessalonians 3.12. And then in verses 5 to 10, he encourages them by the truth of God's judgment. He encourages them them that way. Their flourishing faith and their increasing love in the face of persecution, that's a marker, that's evidence that in the righteous judgment of God on the final day, that they will enter into the rest of the consummated kingdom of God. And the flip side of that righteous judgment is that those unbelievers who are persecuting them for their faith, that they will be repaid with affliction, meaning they will be damned. God will vindicate his faithful people. And this judgment will happen when Christ returns from heaven. At that time, he'll mete out punishment to those who do not know God those who do not obey the gospel of Jesus Christ, and this will be eternal separation from the presence of God. So it is is a horrifying prospect. But he says this, this will happen on that day. Now when we ended, we just started looking at the prayer report in verses 11 and 12. So let me read that, pick back up. I'll repeat some of what I said, and then we'll carry on from there. He says, to this end, we also always pray concerning you that our God may count you worthy of the calling and may powerfully fulfill every desire of goodness and work of faith so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. So here, Paul says in this this prayer report, They're praying that God will bring to completion in the Thessalonians every desire that's motivated by goodness and every work that's inspired by faith. In other words, he wants all of these good impulses that they have to be uh, fulfilled, to, to come to fruition, to be expressed in their lives, not simply to be a thought or a desire but that they will be transformed. In other words, they're praying for God to continue this transforming work in their lives so that the Lord Jesus will be glorified in them, both now and in the future. And as I said, living as a committed disciple, especially in the face of persecution, that glorifies the Lord because it says that He's worthy. He's worthy of allegiance. He's worthy of submission. He's worthy of imitation. Even when doing so results in hardship. It's not like as soon as something difficult comes because of my faith, I jettison my faith and I sell. No, no, no. He's worth more than that. And in that, see, he is, he's then glorified uh, that way. And genuine disciples, they're likewise glorified in him. And that there are some people who will appreciate the quality of their character and the devotion of their lives to the Lord. And ultimately, they'll be glorified in the resurrection and final judgment as a result of being united with Christ. Ultimately, our glorification will be there. As you see here, for example, Romans 8, 17, And if we are children, we're also heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ since we're suffering with him, so that we also may be glorified with him. In Colossians 3, 4, when Christ who is your life is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. And this idea, see, that we will share in that in the final state, that we will share in the glory of the resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15, 42, so also is the resurrection of the dead, it's sown a perishable state, raised an imperishable state, sown in dishonor, raised in glory. And Philippians 3 says, for our commonwealth exists in heaven, from where also we eagerly await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humiliation 
into conformity with the body of his glory by the working of his power even to subject all things to himself. So ultimately this being united with Christ, we are glorified in him now in some sense, but ultimately that being united with Christ will be glorified in the final judgment in the resurrection. Now the change, the change for which they're praying, it's a matter of divine grace. So he's praying that every impulse and thought that's motivated by faith in good things, that it actually come to fruition in their lives. And you see the last clause in verse 12 of this change for which they're praying, it's a matter of divine grace. Now Christians have a role to play in sanctification, in transformation. We have a role to play, a responsibility to yield to the working of the Spirit in our lives. But that work ultimately, that transformation ultimately is the Spirit's work. Our responsibility is to cooperate and yield to what the Spirit is doing, not to resist. He's trying to change us into the image of Jesus. And our role and responsibility, we do have a role, but it is to yield to His transforming work. The transformation that occurs is His work. And you see this nowhere better shown, I think, than in Romans chapter 8, verses 12 and 13, particularly verse 13, where you see this dynamic of our role and the Spirit's role. You see where he says in Romans 8, 12, and 13, Now therefore, brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you are going to die. But if by the Spirit, by the Spirit, you are putting to death the practices of the body. You say, well, if it's by the Spirit, what am I doing? If by the Spirit, you are putting to death. So you see that dynamic, that cooperation aspect. The Spirit is at work, and I'm crucifying these things by the Spirit by yielding and allowing the Spirit. Not resisting, not blocking, but just allowing Christ in me, the Spirit of God in me, to transform me into His image. That's perhaps, like I say, I think that's seen there. Now in chapter 2, verses uh, 1 to 3, I, I'm going to repeat that last part, 3a, when we pick up from 3 to 12, but I wanted to comment on that separately. He says, now brothers, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering to him, we ask that you not be quickly shaken from your understanding or disturbed either by a spirit or by a word or by a letter to the effect that the day of the Lord has come as if that teaching came from us. Let no one deceive you in any way. Now it seems that sometime after receiving 1 Thessalonians, sometime after they received that letter, some in the church in Thessalonica, they became confused and upset based on teaching purportedly from Paul and his companions from the missionaries that the second coming of Christ referred to in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 through 5, 6, that that had already occurred. You see, so somewhere there, there are some who got this idea and they're disturbed by this. You can imagine them wondering, among other things, how could they have missed it? You know, how could they have missed it? And how could they still be getting the hammer? How could they still be uh, being persecuted if that were the case? And Paul and his companions, they somehow learned of this development. We're not told how they learned, but they learned. And we don't know how many months down the road this is. How long after 1 Thessalonians it says it? Three months? Six months? Twelve months? But somewhere this has come into the Thessalonian church... It is disturbing the people, and Paul and his companions have learned about this development, but they weren't clear on how this teaching or this, this information had come to the Thessalonians. They knew about it, that there were some there that were thinking this and were disturbed by this, but they didn't know how they had gotten that idea. And in this section, uh, 3 through 12, 
Paul, to quote Michael Holmes, what Paul is going to do, he says, Paul informs them it is impossible for the day of the Lord to have already arrived because certain events and developments which had not yet taken place must first occur. So this is going to be what Paul is going to tell them. They're worried about this, and Paul is going to say, no, that can't be right, because this must happen first, and that hasn't happened. So that's how he's ministering to them in the approach he's taking. Now the puzzle is, really, or one of the puzzles is, how could the Thessalonians have been distressed by the claim when it seems so obviously wrong? How could they have been distressed by it? Jeffrey Wyman, his commentary, he says, After all, it would have been obvious to them that none of their fellow believers who had fallen asleep, you remember when he was talking about this in 1 Thessalonians? None of the fellow believers who had fallen asleep had been resurrected, 1 Thessalonians 4, 14 and 16. That sudden destruction had not fallen on their unbelieving neighbors, 5, 3. And that there had been no cry of command, voice of an archangel or trumpet call of God to signal the glorious parousia, the coming of Christ. So you'd be saying, now how could they have, how could they have uh, gotten confused about this or been distressed when we look at it and we say it's pretty obvious that that haven't, hadn't happened? Well, I suspect the answer lies in their mistakenly believing that this teaching had come from Paul and his companions. I suspect that's the key to it. Perhaps some aspect of Paul's prior teaching whether in 1 Thessalonians or something he had said orally, perhaps that had been twisted in a way that got some traction. Maybe somebody said who was an alleged prophet had said, this is, what the, this is the inspired interpretation of what Paul meant. And, did that, and that somebody got traction, so they believed that that's what Paul and his companions had said. Or maybe the false teaching didn't come from something that Paul had said or written. It was from something elsewhere that had been wrongly and falsely attributed to Paul and they believed it. Now that would make a difference, wouldn't it? Either way, believing that Paul had now declared that the second coming had occurred, well that would force them to reassess their understanding of his prior teaching. Right? If I, I hear this, I read what Paul is saying, I heard what Paul said, but now Paul says, in my view, having been mistaken, but I'm convinced Paul and his companions, the Spirit of God in Paul, is saying that the second... Well, now I have to make some adjustments. <laughs> Maybe I misunderstood what Paul had meant. Maybe I need to go and do some, uh, you know, rethinking about what he meant there. Maybe some harmonize the new information by concluding that Paul's earlier description of the second coming was intended in a purely spiritual or metaphorical sense. Maybe that would be a way they would put this together. Paul's now saying it's happened. I thought from this, that couldn't be right, but if he's now saying it's happened, maybe this was just metaphorical. We're not told that. What we're told is what Paul taught in 1 Thessalonians. And we're told some people are distressed by teaching that they think comes from Paul and his companions that the second coming had already occurred. Well, Paul's not sure how they're tracing this teaching to him. So he tells the Thessalonians not to be disturbed by any alleged prophecy, that spirit, any oral teaching, that's word or letter, that attributes to him the teaching that the day of the Lord had already come. If that's the substance of the report, whether it's an alleged prophecy whether it's somebody just orally teaching or whether it's from some writing, if that's the substance of the report, it's false. You see, if that's it, Paul has been misrepresented. All right, and whoever makes such a claim is trying to deceive them. Michael Holmes says, he says, for all that Paul knows, and it clearly isn't much, this misunderstanding may have arisen or come to the Thessalonians in one of three ways. It may have come via a prophecy, literally a spirit, that is presumably a prophetic utterance, perhaps spoken by one 
of the congregation or a visitor. See, 1 Thessalonians 5, 19 and 20. Remember, he said, don't quench the spirit, but test everything. You see, test everything because apparently there is this possibility of faux prophecies. And that maybe that was one that someone came in and either said, this is what Paul's teaching uh, authoritatively means, or saying, this is a, you know, something that Paul is, uh, some other way of tying that to Paul. He says here, or a report, literally word, a non-ecstatic spoken message or teaching, or a letter. For, for example, 1 Thessalonians, though the claim is so far removed from anything he actually taught, the possibility of a forged letter crosses his mind. See, somebody pretending to be Paul and writing. So that's the, uh, Paul's just not sure, but Paul's primary concern is not with how the claim reached them, but with its content. That is, the claim that the day of the Lord had already come, which apparently has been attributed to him. So that's why I say, you say, how could they fall for that? Well, if they were convinced that it came from Paul and his companions, well, I can see. They say, you know, Paul's like the word. And so when Paul said that, then I have to make adjustments somewhere else. So, uh, uh, but he's not sure and he, he, he just says, listen, whether, whoever's doing this, if that's the substance of the report, and it's c- claimed coming from me, no. It's, it's false and you're being deceived. In chapter 2, I'm gonna, 3 through 12, I'm gonna, I, I pick back up that, that 3A part. I wanted to mention the deception. So repeating that, but 3 through 12, he says, Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion or apostasy falling away, unless the rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, the one who opposes and exalts himself over every being called God or object of worship, So that he takes a seat in the temple of God, proclaiming that he himself is God. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I was telling you these things? And you know what is now restraining him, so that he will be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only there is now one restraining it until he's out of the way, and then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing with the appearance of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, with all power and lie-promoting signs and wonders, and with every deception of wickedness for those who are perishing because they did not accept the love of the truth so that they may be saved. For this reason, God sends them a working of delusion so they will believe the lie in order that everyone who did not believe the truth but delighted in unrighteousness will be condemned. I know that's kind of small print up there, but I wanted to squeeze it all in on one slide instead of going back and forth because I want to spend some time uh, breaking this down and talking to you about this. Now, in in chapter 1, verses 7 to 10, Paul implicitly rebutted the claim that the day of the Lord had already occurred by making it clear that that day will be an open display of the Lord's glory. A day in which the saints will marvel. So he implicitly rebutted the thing by saying it's going to be an open, obvious thing. But here he explicitly rebuts the claim by reminding them of what he'd already taught them. Now I find this interesting. That here's this very young congregation and Paul is already teaching them these things. And we seem to have very little interest in it. And I think, why does Paul seem to think this is an important thing, that he's teaching this young church this? And you'll see it's taught all over. But anyway, Paul says, he tells him, he rebuts it by reminding of what he'd already taught them, namely that Jesus will not return until the rebellion and the man of lawlessness, the son of destruction, is revealed. And since that hadn't occurred, 
the claim that Jesus had already returned necessarily was false. Because this must happen first, it hasn't happened, and therefore Jesus has not already come back. Now this coming of the man of lawlessness, as I've explained in a number of classes I've taught, I believe that Jesus' teaching in the Olivet Discourse, for example in Matthew 24, that Jesus taught there that the time between his ascension and his return is one of birth pains. It's one of wars, conflicts, disasters, tumult, persecution, false prophets, and lawlessness. That this time of birth pains, it's that time which will intensify as birth pains do, and it will ultimately then give way to his return and all that's associated with that. So that's how I see that the Olivet Discourse is at this period of birth pains between his ascension and his return. And they're going to intensify at the end as birth pains do. And a key figure in the final intensification of persecution and hardship of God's people will be the one depicted in Revelation chapter 13 as the beast rising out of the sea. The one John calls Antichrist. Now Paul here, Paul's man of lawlessness, is typically and rightly identified as that same character. So I believe Antichrist, the, man of, the, the beast rising out of the sea, and the man of lawlessness. These are all references to the same eschatological figure, the same end-time figure. And the coming of this person, it was foretold as early as the book of Daniel in the 6th century B.C., the coming of this person. And it was part of the common stock of early Christian teaching about the end times. I mean, Paul reminds them in verse 5 that he told them these things when he was with them. He told them about the man of lawlessness, the son of destruction, when he was with them. This is stock Christian teaching about the end time. John says in, in 1 John 2.18, he says, Children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard, that Antichrist is coming. Well, they'd already heard that. That was part of the teaching. As you have heard that Antichrist is coming. It's a teaching with which they were familiar. John says, even now, before the coming of the Antichrist they had heard about, even now, many Antichrists, plural, have come. The spirit of Antichrist, many, M-I-N-I, -I, many Antichrists, and M-A-N-Y, you see, they have come. The manifestation of the spirit of Antichrist, it is here in John's opponents of his day. And they express and reflect and are many Antichrists in that they oppose the work of God and his Christ. They are opposed to that. That was evident from their denial of Jesus as the Christ. You see in, in 1 John 2, 22, 2 John 7, and elsewhere. So his opponents are antichrists, plural, in that they are manifestations of the spirit of antichrist, who one day that spirit will be fully manifested in the antichrist. Okay, so this is what man of lawless is here. Now Paul provides several pieces of information about this person. Several pieces of information which when supplemented with information from Revelation reveal that he is the ultimate end time opponent of God. The one who leads the final rebellion against God and his people and who draws people from God through deception. This is, what, this is one of the things that you pick up and see about this character. He is the Satan-inspired. He is not Satan incarnate. 
He is the Satan-inspired ruler of a powerful, worldwide, and violently anti-Christian empire. You can see that in Revelation chapter 13, verses 1 to 9. Note in chapter 12, verse 9, that the dragon is Satan. And you look in 1711 of Revelation, you see the beast is a ruler. And so he is this this person, he's a Satan-inspired ruler of a powerful worldwide and violently anti-Christian empire. And his his anti-Christian attitude, it's implicit in Paul's reference to the rebellion. Or the apostasy. The falling away. You see he's opposed to Christ from what Paul says. And you see his opposition to God. In fact, Paul labels him what? The man of lawlessness. He's the man of lawlessness. So you see there, not just in Revelation. He's opposed to God's work. He's opposed to God's Christ. And he exalts himself as God. And is worshipped by non-Christians throughout the world. You see that in Revelation 13, verses 4 to 8. Revelation 13, 12. And as Paul says in verse 4, he opposes all competitors of worship. And he claims for himself the right of worship. He claims that for himself and his taking a seat in the temple of God is best understood. And it's understood by most commentators, by Bruce and Marshall and Fee and Malherby and Shogren and Wyma. It's best understood as a metaphor for him proclaiming himself to be God and usurping the divine prerogative of worship. This is who this character is. This is what this character wants. Abraham Malherby in his commentary in the Anchor Bible series, he says, the usurpation of the temple of God as the locus for claiming himself to be God symbolizes the gravest act of deviance imaginable. I mean, this, this, you max out, this is ten. You see, in hostility, rebellion, and throwing down against God. That's, that's the picture. This is maxed out throwdown. And then he says here, and to express that is Paul's intention as he writes in starkly apocalyptic language. Now this worship is fostered by the performance of miracles through the power of Satan. You see that in Revelation 13, 11 to 15, Revelation 16, 14, Revelation 19, 20. And as Paul says here in verses 9 and 10, The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with with all power and lie-promoting signs and wonders and with every deception of wickedness. So these miracles are instrumental in his end-time game, in his drawing people and solidifying the opposition to God. They're going to play a role in that. He's involved in organizing the nations for the final battle against God and his Christ, Armageddon. He's involved in that. You see that in Revelation 16, 12 to 16. And he will be destroyed when the Lord returns. You see that in Revelation 16, 15, Revelation 19, 19 to 21, as Paul expresses that. In verse 8, as Paul puts it, the Lord Jesus will slay him with the breath of his mouth and bring him to nothing by the appearance of his coming. So he will be on the scene when the Lord Jesus returns. He will be on the scene when the Lord Jesus returns and he will be brought to nothing by the Lord's return. He will slay him that way. He's involved in that. All right, now th- those who are deceived by the miracles that will be associated with this figure, they're described as those who don't, did not love the truth. They didn't love the truth. If they had loved the truth, they wouldn't have believed the lie that Antichrist is divine. 
if they had loved the truth. You see, that, that would, they wouldn't have bought that, regardless of what miracles were performed on his behalf. You say, well, wait a minute. No, no, no. They believed that they really loved the truth, but they were suckered by the miracles if they loved the truth. They wouldn't have believed the lie that Antichrist is divine. I don't care what he did. Now you say, well, that seems odd. Well, look at Deuteronomy. Look at Deuteronomy 13. It's an analogous situation. There it says, if a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises among you and gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or wonder that he tells you comes to pass. All right, so his stuff's legit. He does something or says something and it comes to pass so that you say, whoa. But he says, okay, we got this person, he does that, and it comes to pass, and if he says... Let us go after other gods which you have not known and let us serve them. You shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. That's it, baby. I don't care what's happening. I don't care what he's doing. I don't care what miracles. When he says that Jesus is not the Christ, that's it. I don't know. Didn't you see this? Yeah, I saw it, I saw it, I saw it. But what I heard was... Jesus is not who he's revealed to be. That's all I need to hear. I always say, you remember Jim Jones? That guy who was at the people's temple who led all those people out there who were, uh, drank Kool-Aid and killed themselves, 930 people, I think. I saw a picture, probably a video, I don't remember, but he, throwing the Bible down and standing on it. And I said, that's a sign under your household that something's wrong. <laughs> you see, he's throwing the Bible down and standing on it. But you see that. See, so it's this idea, I don't care what the signs are. Signs require a theologically corroborating context. And if signs are being done by someone who says, Jesus is not Lord, there's something wrong. You see? There's something wrong. So you see that this happens. He says, you, sh you shall walk after the Lord your God and fear Him, keep His commandments, obey His voice. You shall serve Him and hold fast to Him. But that prophet and that dreamer shall be put to death because he's taught rebellion against the Lord your God. You see, so I see this functioning in the same way. It's God's way of exposing those who really delighted in wickedness. Their true allegiance will be revealed by their rejection of Christ in response to the miracles. So they're going to use the miracles as justification, but they're really rejecting the Christ. And that's something that's significant. Now, Paul says that the timing of Antichrist's appearance, if I'm tracking this right, he says that the timing of Antichrist's appearance is being controlled by the restraint another is putting on the mystery of lawlessness that is already at work. So the timing of this guy's appearance is being controlled by a restraint that is being put on the mystery of lawlessness that's already at work. And that restraint on the mystery of lawlessness, that's the what. You see, that's the what now restraining Antichrist's appearance in verse 6a. It's this restraint on the mystery of lawlessness. That's the what that is restraining Antichrist's appearance. The who of verse 7b is the one restraining that mystery of lawlessness. Okay, so you have a what and a who here. So I'm trying to get you to see how to look at that. Now a mystery, in biblical parlance, it's typically something that's now hidden that would in time be revealed. It's now hidden or obscured, but will in time, it will then become clear. And I think Paul is referring to the spirit of lawlessness or rebellion, this spirit of lawlessness or rebellion against God and His Christ, which though already at work in the world, it's already afoot, it's already loose, but what will one day be revealed with ultimate clarity in the person of Antichrist. So that's this mystery of lawlessness that's out there, but one day it's going to be revealed in stark clarity, crystal clarity. Clarity. He's saying 
in his own way what I think John later said decades later in 1 John 2.18 where he says, even now, you see, even now the coming of the Antichrist that they'd heard about, even now many Antichrists, plural, have come. This lawlessness, this spirit is already at work but it will one day manifest in perfect clarity in the person of Antichrist. And so there's something that is restraining the mystery of lawlessness. There is a who that is restraining that until the time. But that present mystery of lawlessness won't be allowed to blossom into full revelation, into the person of Antichrist, until it is his time from God's perspective. God is controlling when things play out. He will not be allowed to manifest on the stage of history until God's time. And at some point, the one restraining the mystery of lawlessness will cease to do so. Will move out of the way and then the man of lawlessness will appear on the stage of history. But not until that restraint has been removed. And I think his point parallels... What I think John says in, in Revelation chapter 20 verses 1 to 3... There he says, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. And he seized the dragon, the ancient serpent, who was the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years and threw him into the pit and shut it and sealed it over him so that he not yet deceived the nations. You see, I got a little asterisk there. Eti, yet is a perfectly acceptable translation. It's not always rendered that way. But I'm rendering it that way, and I want you to see, so I cite Gregory Beale, and I, that seems to be the sense of the New English translation, too. So that he not yet deceived the nations until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be released for a while. So here, you see that Satan is bound in the sense he's prevented from deceiving the nations. So as to prematurely gather them for the ultimate confrontation with God. He's prevented from doing that. Revelation 23 specifically says that the reason for his binding is to prevent him from deceiving the nations. And since miraculous power is the means by which Satan ultimately will deceive the nations into gathering against God, you can see in Matthew 24, 24, 2 Thessalonians 2, 9 and 10, Revelation 13, 13 and 14, Revelation 16, 14, Revelation 19, 20. Those miracles are going to be the key to his organizing the end time opposition. And given that, I think the binding more specifically represents the elimination of Satan's power to perform nation gathering miracles. I think he's been restrained in his ability to do that until the time of God's choosing. And that thousand years, that represents, that, that represents uh, the fullness of God's time. It's ten cubed. In other words, I, th I think what he's saying in Revelation 20 is that Satan will in no way jump the gun and thereby dictate the timing of the end. He will not do that. He will not be released in the imagery that the power to do nation-gathering miracles won't be restored. He will not be released until the precise moment God desires. Now this depriving, I heard that first bell so I'm really worried. This depriving Satan, of the, this depriving him of the power to perform nation-gathering miracles until God's time for Antichrist's appearance, I think that's what Paul refers to as restraining the mystery of lawlessness. Keeping this obscure force in check until the time for Antichrist's appearance when the nature of that lawlessness will be fully manifested. It will be manifested crystal in a crystal clear way. And since the one who binds Satan in 21 to 3 to prevent him from being able to perform the nation, nation gathering miracles, since the one who binds him there is an angel, I assume that the one who restrains the mystery of lawlessness in 2 Thessalonians 2 7, until the time of Antichrist's appearance, that that one's an angel. Perhaps it's the angel Michael, a powerful spiritual being who plays a significant leadership role in God's heavenly army and who in Jude 9 is identified as an archangel. And interestingly, in 1 Thessalonians 4 16, Paul mentions an archangel 
in conjunction with the second coming. So it seems to me that the one, if I were, you know, pushed, I would say it's an angel who's, who's being employed to do this work of God until God's time when he'll be removed and then we'll have this manifestation in God's time. And then Jesus, while he's on the scene, will return and turn him into nothing. You see, he will return and overthrow him with the splendor of his coming. And as I pointed out regarding uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 and 2, Paul there confirms and he reinforces their understanding that there is an element of unpredictability about the second coming. It would come like a thief in the night, meaning it'll come at an unknown time with negative consequences for those who aren't prepared. Well, here he emphasizes that certain events must precede the second coming. In order to put to rest their concern from this false idea that the second coming had already occurred. But whatever signs may precede the Lord's return, they won't be such as to completely remove the element of unpredictability. And you can see how that would work. When Antichrist is on the scene, those of us, I hope, may have sharp eyes and understanding, but there'll be many people say life goes on. Things are always the same. You got politics, you got stuff going on. You see, so there'll be an element of unpredictability all the time. I, well, that's okay. I really thought I'd get further, but uh, thanks for coming. I'm going to try next week to finish. Uh, I may have to talk really fast. Thanks. <laughs>